two minutes. Uh, One minute to go. Okay, it's, it's 2 p.m. now, so we should start. Okay, colleagues, uh, uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this parallel session of the press summit of the United Nations Food uh, System Summit 2021. Uh, I am Bruno Loche, I'm a political economist at CIRAD and the head of the policy and governance program of the Center of Excellence in Food Security in South Africa. I uh, will moderate the session and I will be the usual bad guy, I mean the timekeeper, because we face the usual time constraints. Uh, before my introduction, uh, first uh, an important information uh, online interpretation is provided uh, during this uh, virtual meeting uh, into French, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And please, you can choose your language from the interpretation icon. There is a small globe at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so, um, uh, dear, dear participants and, and colleagues, uh, we... I, I addressed a, a worldwide greetings um, uh, because uh, we have more than uh, 450 registered participants uh, from every region of the world, from the Philippines to Africa and to Chile, and we are representing a, a huge diversity of profiles, positions, and perspectives. We have people engaged and interested in landscape partnerships, uh, urban food systems, territorial development, uh, indigenous territories, local food networks, uh, also people from the private sector, NGOs, international organizations, academia, government, and from different levels of government, local, subnational, national, and regional. So we are joining the events because we believe that food system transformation is vital to address uh, global and local challenges, that the complexity of uh, interrelated challenges can be better addressed through territorial approaches, which give a critical dimension to territorial governance. And this is why we will discuss how territorial approaches can contribute to the design and implementation of an inclusive uh, multi-level governance arch architecture. So we will post uh, some links uh, related to UNFSS material on, th on this topic in the chat during the session. So about our agenda, uh, so I think that we, we, we can have the, sli the slide with the agenda now. Uh, so we will, have, um, uh, we will have five segments in our session, as you can see on the screen. Uh, the bios of the different speakers will be shared in the chat when they speak. 
Uh, first, we will have opening remarks, short opening remarks by representatives of the UN, OECD, FAO, and the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, then we will have five speakers representing different positions and territorial scales in the food system, in food system governance, international level, regional level, country level, and city region levels. And they will have an allocated time of eight minutes. Then we will have an, an open discussion. Of course, it will be frustrating as usual because too short, but our plan is to produce an edited version of the chat and the Q&A, uh, which will be circulated together with the reports and the recording of the event after the session. So please don't hesitate to contribute during the session. Uh, it's an opportunity to share views and comments. Uh, then we will have a five minute summary of the main messages and the concluding remarks. So I, of course, have a couple of some words about logistics and practicalities. Uh, as said before, we have interpretation. So please speak slowly and clearly to facilitate the work of interpreters. Speak close to the microphone and hold any hangy cable microphones. Silence phone apps and devices when you take the floor and be mindful of background noise. Uh, my final introduction words will be to thank uh, all the members of the ad hoc working group on territorial governance for their involvement in the preparation of this event. Uh, with a special thanks to the community of Portuguese speaking countries for the support to translation. And of course, to Eco Agriculture Partners and the UN Habitat for the additional technical support and particularly eco agriculture partners, uh, the host of the event. So now uh, I will, uh, I will uh, give uh, uh, not, not the floor, but we will start uh, the opening remarks with uh, a, a video, video uh, of uh, Amina, Mrs. Amina Mohammed, uh, United Nations Deputy Secretary General uh, with chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Group. Thank you. Excellencies, colleagues, the recent United Nations report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world raised an urgent alarm. There was a dramatic worsening of global hunger last year, much of it likely related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The number of chronically undernourished people has risen to between 720 and 811 million, around a tenth of the world's population. More than 2.3 billion people, nearly one third of the world's population, lacked year-round access to adequate food. And for every 10 food insecure men, there are 11 food insecure women. These figures show that the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified the challenges we face. It will take a tremendous effort for the world to honour its pledge to end hunger by 2030. If we are going to get back on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, we need to find inclusive processes through which we can build a strong recovery that leaves no one behind. Global challenges are increasingly interlinked and reinforce each other. Our efforts to respond must also be strongly coordinated and aligned with each other to have maximum impact. That is the thinking behind the Food Systems Summit and behind this dialogue on territorial governance for sustainable food systems. The core principles of territorial development, people-centered, place-based, participatory, multi-actor, multi-level, and cross-sectoral are essential to create a more coherent governance architecture which would transform our food systems. These principles have come through strongly in the preparations of the Food System Summit. We now need to operationalize them effectively. Broad alliances and partnerships are essential to promoting sustainable and inclusive territorial food systems in support of the 2030 Agenda. This dialogue is an important opportunity to build such joint endeavours. I send you my best wishes for a successful event. Thank you. So thank you. After this uh, video introduction by Mrs. Uh, Amina Mohammed, I will give the floor to Mr. Giorgio Marapodi uh, from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he is uh, the Director General for Cooperation for Development, and also the 
Italian representative uh, at the uh, UN Food uh, System Summit adv Advisory Committee. Please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Losh. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to me to be with you today. I I was uh, very glad to listen to the message of the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed. I want also to salute Mrs. Semedo and Mrs. And Mrs. Aziza. Uh, the th these three organizations represent the main institutions we have been working with this uh, BC year, and uh, I would say also with great success. I, I also wish to thank the organizer for the opportunity to join the panel, which gives me the opportunity to talk about one of the theme of the development ministerial meeting that we had in Matera uh, following the joint session of foreign affairs and development uh, at the end of June. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic has uh, exacerbated the food security crisis causing a delay in the path towards the achievement of the zero hunger goal by 2030. It is therefore urgent to scale up global efforts towards safe and adequate nutrition for all, ending all forms of malnutrition. In paving the way towards a more sustainable recovery from the pandemic, sustainable food systems become even more essential in guaranteeing access to food and a healthy diet. In this context, local authorities are crucial actors to both achieve SDG2 and mitigate the complex impacts of the pandemic as they are best placed to localize sustainable food systems within local communities. Intermediary cities offer a significant but often unexplored and underutilized transformational potential for achieving the SDGs at the local level and provide a concrete contribution to build sustainable food systems. Acting as bridges in the local economic systems and the national urban systems, they can play a determinant role in articulating a rural urban continuum, addressing problems, finding solutions, and implementing actions in concert with national governments to advance a development model that is more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, and leaves no one and no place behind. They deserve greater attention. To this end, the G20 Italian presidency is working towards the establishment of a G20 platform on SDG localization and intermediary cities, an open and inclusive space for policy dialogue to support local, national, and international actions to address these gaps and optimize the development potential of intermediary cities and supporting efforts for SDGs localization. This is specifically true also for food systems. Local food systems with their agroictic bio biodiversity, landscape, socioeconomic and cultural heritage represent a strategic resource essential for the food transition towards a more sustainable, resilient, fair and democratic food system. They constitute an intrinsic an intrinsic value and a tool to build a bridge of interconnection, exchange, and international collaboration within the Food Systems Summit and in close relationship with the work of the G20 and COP26. In preparation of, of this summit, and I conclude, we have been working through a national dialogue, which include all interested stakeholders, stimulating new, numerous independent dialogues that involve the civil society, the academy, institutions, international organizations present in Italy, and trade associations. I must say that many of these dialogues came spontaneously, came spontaneously from local realities, small networks, and the local food systems. This is certainly a characteristic of the diversity of Italy and its food traditions, 
but I think it is a model that is worth exploring in other contexts, a model that can contribute to the final objective to have more sustainable, resilient, and working food systems. Thank you, and over to you, Mr. Roche. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Marapodi. So now I will give the floor to our next speaker, Mrs. Maria Elena Semedo, uh, who is Deputy Secretary General for Climate and Natural Resources at the FAO. Thank you, Bruno. Good morning, good afternoon to all. Uh, Mrs. Amina Mohamed, United Nations Deputy Secretary General, Mr. Georges Bonjesus, Prime Minister from Saint Tomé Principe and uh, President of the National Food Security and Nutrition Council, uh, Mr. Giorgio Marapodi, Director General for Cooperation Development from Italy, Excellencies Ambassador, uh, dear speakers, organizers, colleagues, friends, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to be at this important event on territorial governance for sustainable food systems. As already mentioned by uh, the Deputy Secretary General and uh, Mr. Giorgio, the just released 2021 State of Food Security and Nutrition highlights a challenging situation steaming for increasing global food insecurity. With less than a decade to 2030, we are not on track to ending world hunger and malnutrition. In fact, we are moving in the wrong direction. On top of that, the impacts of COVID-19 have been detrimental to the food systems and economies around the world, especially for small scale producers, particularly women and youth, whose incomes are, and livelihoods were hard hit. The same people who had limited access to social protection and relief measures. Finally, today's words present other interconnected challenge, increasing competition for natural resources and land, ecosystem degradation, climate crisis coupled with intensified urbanization, growing population and changing consumer demands. In this context, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations recognize the need to move beyond silo-specific approaches, to move towards agri-food system governance frameworks that allow for more coherent policies, program, and investment. And this will be critical to building transformative multi-sector portfolios of policies, investment, and legislation that become win-win solution and help manage trade-offs. Therefore, multi-sector government-led mechanism, as it also been said, may need to be further expanded to ensure a whole of government approach and for increased policy cohesion. I think this is the challenge we have ahead, how we can have all the government together and break the silos. In this regard, territorial approaches are contributing to the development of strong multi-level governance frameworks that can better direct and target action and interaction from local to supranational levels. Today's event will highlight the important role of territorial approaches in establishing these multi-level frameworks through formal and informal institutions and partnerships at local to national level. Territorial approach can enable inclusive food system transformation and long-term governance solutions that will improve food security, boost environmental sustainability, and spur economic prospects. We look forward to learning about the challenge and opportunities facing officials from local governments to region, regional intergovernment organization. And we look forward to forging stronger interlinked global partnership to promote territorial sustainable agri-food system to deliver the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. 
thank you again for inviting FAO to be on this event. We'll be completely committed to follow up of this discussion after the Food System Summit. And I thank you for your attention. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Semedo. Now uh, the final uh, opening remarks will be given by Mrs. Aziza Akmush uh, from OECD, uh, who is uh, head of the city's Urban Policies and Sustainable Development Division. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and let me start by saying how thrilled and proud we are from the OECD to co-host this event because the topic of a territorial approach to public policies at large and to food security and nutrition in particular is one that has been very close to our heart for many years. And actually back in 2016 already, we had launched a, a full-fledged program on this topic, a territorial approach to food security and nutrition with FAO, UNDCF and many other organizations to raise the awareness and strive to guide public action in donor and, and partner countries. And many of the countries that we then covered uh, in the analytical work ranging from Colombia to Peru, all the way through Morocco, Mali, Ivory Coast or even Niger, where despite their varying levels of economic development, fiscal capacity and uh, institutional and governance framework facing one common challenge, which was that in most cases, these food security policies were largely uh, driven by top down and sectoral approaches. And that's a call we did make at the time that, you know, national average and strategies can actually mask huge territorial disparities and inequalities, which we know within the OECD countries tend to actually be much more important within countries and across uh, countries. And that's why you actually need that granular action because geography matters when it comes to targeting policy interventions. And so that's the first takeaway that really uh, I would like to convey here that that territorial approach is one that actually takes you from a sectoral to a multi-sectoral dynamic, is one that helps you shift away from that old regional development paradigm that essentially relied on transfers and cash basis and massive subsidies to lagging regions to one that is actually building on the territorial assets of, of different territories. And a territorial approach is one that really agrees that and, and concurs that one size doesn't, need, uh, doesn't fit all, that you need place-based action and that you need multi-level governance. And that's why actually I would like to convey that this uh, territorial approach lends to food security is one that has inspire the much more, uh, much broader undertaking at the OECD to develop a territorial approach to all sustainable development goals, because it's not just a compliance agenda and notably for local and regional governments, it's a policy framework to really rethink from the ground up how you design and implement policies, how you plan, how you allocate budget, how you prioritize investment. So that's really a first point that I wanted to convey. The second point that has come out of recent work we've done at the OECD is that food systems are not only, or better say, not any longer a mere sectoral and rural issue. They have increasingly become an urban development priority. And we've seen this in all the work we've been doing around the degree of urbanization, where we saw basically that the world is no longer split between cities, where roughly 48% of the world population lives now uh, in cities functioning urban areas above 50,000 inhabitants and on the other side rural areas about 20 8% of the global population, you have in between the semi-dense areas and towns which are essential to that rural urban connection. And increasingly urbanization demands for more integration with rural areas and food systems. And this is an important entry point for such uh, an integration. And, and that's a point we've seen with many of the mayors we've been uh, working with over the past few months, especially, and that's my uh, last point, uh, because COVID-19 has magnified these territorial disparities, but also the need to better connect cities of all sides with their rural hinterlands. And 
food systems to some extent can really contribute to that, to that territorial cohesion, to a much more balanced urbanization that is calling for a win-win partnership between rural and urban and no longer that zero-sum logics we've experienced in the past. And not only because of the disruption of global supply chains during the pandemic, which have raised the question in many cities, especially large ones of self-sufficiency and autonomy, but also because of citizens' expectations to have more proximity, more local loop, more buy-in local, more uh, autonomy and circular economy. And these uh, paradigm shifts and, and, and increasing expectation for uh, environmental sustainability and uh, local proximity are basically raising a full window of opportunity to connect food systems with urban uh, development. So I really look forward to the conversation today. I thank you all so much and including our Italian colleagues and, and UN Habitat for that profile you are giving to this conversation on localizing sustainable development and the role of intermediary cities in the G20. And we stand ready um, to pursue the conversation after the event. Uh, thank you all for your opening remarks. So we will move directly now to the, the, the core part of our, our events. And uh, we will start with the first speaker, uh, who is uh, Ambassador Maya Squeff. Uh, she is an uh, Argentina representative to the Summit Advisory Committee. And uh, she is also former uh, CFS chair. Please, Ambassador. Muchas gracias, Bruno. Muchas gracias a los organizadores por esta invitación para participar en este evento que es eh, muy próximo a la inauguración de la precumbre de los sistemas alimentarios en Roma que iniciará sus trabajos el día lunes. Argentina se encuentra participando activamente en el proceso preparatorio de la cumbre de sistemas alimentarios y como, como usted bien dijo, me complace ser miembro del comité asesor en representación del Grupo de América Latina y el Caribe, junto con Antigua y Barbuda, y también estamos participando en otros espacios de la cumbre, como son los Action Tracks. Ahora bien, me gustaría realizar algunas reflexiones sobre el tema que se aborda en este encuentro, la gobernanza territorial para los sistemas alimentarios sostenibles. Permítame destacar que la transición hacia la sostenibilidad de los sistemas productivos es una decisión soberana de cada estado, que es el principal actor responsable de la seguridad alimentaria y debe ser gradual eh, y en las formas y tiempos que cada país, en base a su realidad productiva, económica y social. En ese sentido es fundamental que sean reconocidas y respetadas las realidades locales de, los de las diferentes regiones del mundo y sus particularidades productivas, sociales y ambientales. Estimados colegas, no hay un modelo único de desarrollo que sirva a todas las naciones del mundo, así que es fundamental una visión inclusiva de la sostenibilidad de los sistemas alimentarios con soluciones que se adapten a las realidades y necesidades locales basados en argumentos científicos sólidos. Cuando hablamos de gobernanza territorial, nos referimos a la capacidad de las sociedades de resolver sus asuntos y de contribuir al desarrollo de sus territorios mediante la articulación y participación de diversos actores territoriales, entre ellos el Estado, la sociedad civil, las agencias públicas localizadas territorialmente y el sector privado. Un claro ejemplo de espacio en el que la comunidad internacional eh, debe o puede y tiene para reflejar todas las sinergias y discusiones de estos múltiples actores es el Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria Mundial, creado en 1974 y sometido a una reforma en el año 2009. En efecto, es la principal plataforma internacional, intergubernamental e incluyente para una amplia gama de partes interesadas comprometidas en trabajar de manera conjunta para eliminar el hambre y garantizar la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición para todas y todos. Como parte de mi carrera profesional, pude liderar y formar parte del proceso de reforma 
ya que ejercí la presidencia del Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria en su 35 periodo de sesiones, por el que me gustaría compartir al, con ustedes los ejes de ese proceso. Eh, fue un periodo extraordinario de noviembre de 2008 con la conferencia de la FAO, acuérdense, 2008, crisis del precio de los alimentos, que solicita a la FAO, al Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria, que por otra parte está abierto a todos los estados de la FAO, a las ONG, al sector privado y a la sociedad civil, y que ha recibido el mandato de hacer un seguimiento de la evolución de la seguridad alimentaria del mundo, Insisto, la FAO le solicita que trate de desempeñar plenamente su papel en el nuevo dispositivo de gobernanza mundial. Teniendo en cuenta dicho objetivo, la reforma del comité se centró en cuatro aspectos fundamentales. La gobernanza, el trabajo en el terreno, el panel de expertos y la movilización de recursos atravesados por algunas ideas fuerza, tales como la búsqueda de mayor transparencia flexibilidad y participación. La mesa o el buró estuvo integrada por representantes de Bélgica, Federación de Rusia, Jordania y Madagascar, junto con la presidencia argentina. Se convocó un grupo de contacto integrado por representantes de los Estados miembros, por las organizaciones de Naciones Unidas y por representantes de la sociedad civil. Como resultado de un amplio proceso participativo e inclusivo, la reforma aprobada y en curso desde el 17 de octubre de 2009 se afirma en algunos pilares centrales que permitir, permitirán y tienen, tenían y tienen como objetivo mejor, mejorar la performance histórica del comité. En primer lugar, se propuso una ampliación de los actores involucrados en la respuesta a la creciente demanda que las hambrunas generan. Esto significa la participación no solo de los estados nacionales, principal actor en el tema, y de los organismos internacionales, sino también una activa participación de las organizaciones sociales y las entidades de la sociedad civil que exhiben logros focalizados en diferentes lugares del mundo. En segundo lugar, se dispuso la incorporación de diversas agencias internacionales a los fines de producir respuestas integrales y pluridimensionales. Recuerdo que tanto IFAT o FIDA como el Programa Mundial de Alimentos participaron activamente y también invitamos a la OMC, que fue un poco menos participativa en aquel momento, pero que figura como organización para participar de los debates y de las acciones. Entonces les decía, eh, en, ese, en un mundo, ¿no es cierto?, en un mundo de alta espe especialización científica, se suele olvidar que lo real es un todo integrado y coherente y que ante el hambre, por ejemplo, las respuestas deben apuntar a la promoción de un desarrollo sustentable en las comunidades más necesitadas. La tarea entre agencias, entre agencias de Naciones Unidas, es un verdadero reto. Todas han desarrollado un altísimo nivel de expertise y entendemos que la coordinación, la complementación, la interactuación entre ellas va a redundar en generación de alternativas superadoras de las que cada una puede realizar en forma aislada. En tercer lugar, creemos hay que atender especialmente al desarrollo en el terreno de las acciones que se encaren. Las acciones a cargo de los estados deberán responder a una doble finalidad temporal, acudir a dar la respuesta urgente para el aquí y el ahora, y a la vez sostener el trabajo en el terreno para que las comunidades aludidas puedan desarrollar medios y modos de producción, al menos para la autosustentación futura. Y para ello es insoslayable la activa participación de los estados nacionales que definen sus prioridades, pero también de los actores locales. En esta reforma fue crucial que el comité promoviera la coordinación en los planos nacional y regional, la rendición de cuentas y el seguimiento de las mejores prácticas en todos los niveles. Si hay algo que caracterizó esta propuesta de reforma del comité, fueron los niveles de flexibilidad. Flexibilidad para entender que no hay un programa mágico que produzca soluciones globales. 
para aunar los esfuerzos y recursos de todo tipo de las más diversas agencias. Este proceso también permitió comprender que resulta esencial hacer uso de los mecanismos y estructuras existentes. Uno de los ejes fue la coordinación, complementación e interactuación de todas las agencias de Naciones Unidas con competencia en el tema de seguridad alimentaria. Sobre este punto, me gustaría hacer un nexo con la cumbre de sistemas alimentarios del secretario general que nos convoca en este encuentro. Fíjense, la reforma del comité fue en el año 2008, 2009, perdón, al año de la crisis del precio de los alimentos. Y el señor secretario general está convocando en un momento de gran crisis debido a otro eh, problema, básicamente al problema del COVID-19. Un mundo que ya venía en crisis recibe esta tragedia que se llama COVID-19. La cumbre de los sistemas alimentarios entonces debe constituir una nueva oportunidad y espacio para mostrar buenas prácticas de los estados en lo que hace a sistemas alimentarios sostenibles, pero no debe ser su objetivo crear nuevas estructuras en la comunidad internacional, sino trabajar con las existentes, cuya base está en Roma, especialmente en la FAO y en el Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria Mundial. Resulta clave que estas agencias y organizaciones con competencia primaria en la materia garanticen en sus debates las discusiones y la participación de múltiples actores que puedan tener un involucramiento o que tienen un involucramiento activo en esta iniciativa del secretario general. Queda favor, claro que en todas estas discusiones no se trata de crear nuevas instancias, sino de mejorar y reforzar y coordinar lo que existe para que nuestra acción sea más eficaz. El último informe sobre el estado de seguridad alimentaria y nutrición en el mundo nos brinda unas cifras alarmantes. Hoy contamos con entre 720 y 811 millones de personas en el mundo que padecen hambre. Esto significa 118 millones de personas más que en 2019. Teniendo en cuenta este difícil escenario agravado por la tragedia COVID-19 que ha profundizado aún más la inseguridad alimentaria, el gran desafío es producir más y mejores alimentos para una población mundial en crecimiento con respecto a las tres dimensiones de la sostenibilidad económica, social y ambiental. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, señora embajadora. Uh, now I will give the, the floor to the, the next speaker. Uh, with um, uh, Armindo Fernandez, uh, uh, Director General of the Community of um, uh, Portuguese Speaking Countries. Please go ahead. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Excelentíssima Senhora Amina Mohamed, Secretária Geral Adjunta das Nações Unidas. Excelentíssima Senhora Maria Helena Semente. Diretora-Geral Adjunta da FAO. Excelentíssimo Sr. Giorgio Marapoda, Diretor-Geral da Cooperação e Desenvolvimento de Itália. Excelentíssima Sr. Aziz Akmuz, da OCDE. Excelentíssima Sra. Embaixadora Maria Suef, representante da Argentina no Comitê Assessor da Semeira das Nações Unidas sobre Sistemas Alimentares Sustentáveis. Excelentíssimo Sr. Jorge Bom Jesus. Primeiro-Ministro e Presidente do Conselho Nacional de Segurança Alimentar de São Paulo e Príncipe. Excelentíssima Senhora Emília Sai, Secretária-Geral da União das Cidades e Governos Locais, minhas senhoras e meus senhores. Muito boa tarde a todos e os meus votos sinceros de boa saúde nesses tempos difíceis que estamos todos a, a viver. Gostaria de começar por endereçar as nossas felicitações à FAO, à OCDE, às Nações Unidas e aos demais parceiros pela organização deste importante evento e os nossos sinceros agradecimentos pelo convite para participarmos dele. Como sabem, o território da CPP é atualmente habitado por cerca de 270 milhões de pessoas, distribuídas por quatro continentes e nove países. 
falamos de Angola, do Cabo Verde, da Guiné-Bissau, da Guiné-Equatorial, do Moçambique, de São Tomé e Príncipe, todos em África, do Brasil, na América do Sul, do Timor-Leste, na Ásia e de Portugal, na Europa. Usei propositadamente a expressão território para falar da CPP e permitam-me eh, que explique porquê. Embora geograficamente distanciados pelo mar, que paradoxalmente é também um elemento agregador da nossa identidade marítima comum, os nossos países estão unidos por um património ecológico e cultural historicamente consolidado. Este património materializa-se também numa língua partilhada e na existência de sistemas agrícolas e paisagens alimentares com diversos aspectos comuns e complementares. Além disso, partilhamos um projeto político que nos traz a este evento, que é a erradicação da fome e da malnutrição dos nossos países. Este projeto está traduzido na nossa Estratégia de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da CPP, formulada entre 2009 e 2011, ano em que foi aprovado, em Luanda, pelo 16º Conselho de Ministros da CPP. A Estratégia de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da CPP possui três prioridades ou eixos de intervenção. Primeiro, fortalecer a governança do nosso sistema alimentar. Segundo, expandir a proteção social e melhorar a nutrição. E terceiro, fortalecer a agricultura familiar. Inspirados pela reforma do Comitê Mundial de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional das Nações Unidas, em 2009, elegemos a construção de uma arquitetura de governança para a segurança alimentar e nutricional da CPP como a nossa primeira prioridade. Reforço a CD, começamos pela construção de um modelo de governança multissectorial multi-atores, multinível e inclusiva, para gerar os consensos necessários sobre os acordos e ações a implementar nos, mais demais, nos demais eixos da nossa estratégia. E assim, em 2012, no âmbito da nona conferência do chefe de Estado e do Governo da CPP, realizada em Maputo, em Moçambique, nascia o Conselho de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da CPP. Participam nesse conselho os representantes do governo, da sociedade civil, do setor privado, das academias, dos parlamentos, e a breve texto, também os representantes do poder local de todos os países membros da CPP. Essa participação foi cuidadosamente planeada, discutida de forma a garantirmos, numa mitologia de baixo para cima, uma adequada representação dos grupos em situação de maior vulnerabilidade. A autonomia de organização dos vários atores, através da criação de mecanismos para facilitação da sua participação no Conselho de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da CPP, a coerência do próprio modelo de governança, traduzida na sua ligação funcional com os níveis global e, em particular, e em particular desculpem, com o Comitê Mundial de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional das Nações Unidas. Por estas razões, o nosso Conselho de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional é composto por um representante do governo de cada Estado-membro, preferencialmente pelo presidente em exercício do Conselho Nacional de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional Nacional, oito representantes da sociedade civil, com prioridade para a participação dos grupos mais vulneráveis e afetados pela insegurança alimentar, em particular as organizações de mulheres rurais e os camponeses, dois representantes da das academias, dois representantes do setor privado, dois representantes da área parlamentar, indicados pela Assembleia Parlamentar da CPP, e logo que possível, dois representantes do poder local. Por estas palavras, cerca de dois terços dos participantes do nosso Conselho de Segurança Alimentar e Internacional são oriundos da sociedade civil, academia, setor privado e parlamentares, sendo que a sociedade civil representa metade destes participantes. Ao nível de cada país, foram-se, entretanto, estabelecendo plataformas nacionais seguindo uma lógica similar. De referir que em 2020, dos novos Estados-membros da comunidade, sete possuíam estruturas de governança do sistema alimentar aprovadas por decreto do Conselho de Ministros. O senhor Primeiro-Ministro, São Tomé e Príncipe, 
terá hoje, certamente, a possibilidade de apresentar como exemplo o Conselho de Segurança Nacional, Alimentar e Nutricional do seu país. Gostaria agora de referir algumas das conquistas obtidas na, pela CPP após o início deste processo. De acordo com dados da FAO, as pessoas desnutridas nos países membros da CPP passaram de 28 para 11 milhões de 2010 a 2017. Esta impressionante redução não se deve unicamente à coordenação e coerência das políticas nacionais obtidas a partir da governança implementada, mas a arquitetura implementada permitiu, sem dúvida, um intercâmbio de conhecimento muito substancial entre os países e os seus atores no espaço da segurança militar e internacional e o reforço da confiança entre todos os participantes. Esta arquitetura permitiu, também, Acordos expressivos entre os países nos domínios do programa de saúde, alimentação e nutrição escolar, leis da agricultura familiar, promoção da agroecologia, promoção de sistemas agrícolas, patrimônio da comunidade, investimentos agrícolas, construção de capacidades institucionais e desenvolvimento de programas para a materialização de sistemas alimentares territoriais e dietas saudáveis. A terceira reunião ordinária do Conselho de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da CPP, que teve lugar recentemente em Luanda, no passado dia 15 de julho, aprovou um conjunto de recomendações iniciais para a Cimeira das Nações Unidas sobre Sistemas Alimentares. Estas recomendações têm origem num processo de consultas e diálogo que visou reforçar esta arquitetura de governança. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, para concluir, Gostaria de referir que nestes quase 10 anos foram apreendidas muitas lições. A primeira é que, efetivamente, se revelou possível montar uma arquitetura multinível para a governança do sistema alimentar. Não foram necessários apontar os recursos internacionais para o fazer, embora naturalmente esses possam acelerar o processo. A segunda é que esta arquitetura deve ser legada e politicamente apoiada pelos governos a quem compete a formulação e implementação das políticas públicas para a transformação do sistema alimentar no quadro da realização progressiva do direito humano à alimentação adequada. A terceira é que a participação dos diversos atores relevantes deve fazer-se de forma a discriminar positivamente os grupos em situação de vulnerabilidade e ou reduzir o acesso a recursos e políticas públicas. A quarta refere-se a importância e o imenso desafio da participação do poder local nos órgãos de governança nacionais, considerando os relevantes processos de descentralização em curso na maioria dos nossos países. A quinta, diz respeito à necessidade de construção de capacidades a nível nacional e supranacional para a gestão, montagem e funcionamento de uma arquitetura institucional multissectorial e inclusiva. Para concluir, Gostaria de referir que a CPP está disponível para participar num mecanismo global para o reforço destas abordagens no contexto da Cimeira das Nações Unidas sobre Sistemas Alimentares e sente-se honrada por, nesse contexto, poder continuar a partilhar a sua experiência com outros territórios e países. Muito obrigado pela vossa amável atenção. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Fernandez, thank you for your presentation uh, and uh, the, the, your input about the, the, the CP. I give uh, the floor to uh, Prime Minister of Santo in President of uh, the National Food Security. Please go ahead. Mr. Prime Minister, you, are, you have the floor.
Excelentíssima senhora. Alô? Excelentíssima senhora Amina Mohamed, secretária-geral adjunta das Nações Unidas. Excelentíssima senhora Maria Helena Sumido, diretora-geral adjunta do Sal. Excelentíssimo senhor Jorge Arapona, diretor-geral de Cooperação e Desenvolvimento de Itália. Excelentíssima senhora Aziza Acumuxa, do OCDE. Senhora embaixadora Maria Skev, representante da Argentina no Comitê Assessor da Cimeira das Nações Unidas sobre Sistemas Alimentares Sustentáveis. Senhora Emília Tais, secretária-geral da União das Cidades e Governos Locais. Embaixador Armindo Fernandes, diretor-geral da CPLP, estimados convidados, senhoras e senhores, excelências. Gostaria, em primeiro lugar, de felicitar a iniciativa deste evento, protagonizado pelo FAO, OCDE e demais parceiros, desta plataforma de diálogo, troca de ideias, boas práticas e ponte de parcerias futuras. Em segundo lugar, não posso deixar de aproveitar esta sublime ocasião que este palco virtual me oferece para apresentar Santo Meio Príncipe, país insular de cerca de 204 mil habitantes, terra abençoada e plantada pelas mãos da natureza no centro do mundo, com raízes no Atlântico, na porta de entrada do Golfo da Guiné, a cerca de 300 quilômetros da costa africana. Importa aqui salientar que Santo Meio Príncipe resume-se numa história de encontros e cruzamentos de terra fértil, de plantas frondosas, e de gente oriunda de todos os quadrantes. Aliás, são homens que trouxeram plantas e plantas que trouxeram mais homens. Por conseguinte, a conformação histórica do sistema alimentar de Santo Meio e Príncipe assenta sobre um frágil ecossistema pressionado por um sistema agrário agroexportador, importante fonte de divisas para o nosso país. Trata-se, portanto, de um sistema que possui uma elevada dependência da ajuda externa e que não foi ainda capaz de resolver os problemas de insegurança alimentar e nutricional. Senhoras e senhores, excelências, permitam-me em jeito de síntese, resumir um conjunto de fatores e características que caracterizam o sistema alimentar e nutricional de Santo Meio Príncipe. Primeiro, a insegurança alimentar e nutricional nos meios rural e urbano, no interior e no litoral. Persistência de desigualdades de gênero e acesso aos recursos. Aumento da pobreza rural, do êxodo rural, das alterações das dietas tradicionais e da cultura alimentar, a degradação da paisagem, a elevação eh, do consumo dos fatores de produção, aumento dos problemas fitossanitários e a incapacidade de alimentar uma população que cresce 
a uma taxa de cerca de 2% ao ano. Outros tipos de desafios complexos, com abordagem intersectorial e que exigem o envolvimento de todos os atores. É partindo desse pressuposto que desde 2016 fora criada uma plataforma para a governança do sistema alimentar. Conselho Nacional de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional de Santo Meio Príncipe. Este conselho é presidido pelo primeiro-ministro e chefe do governo e tem como vice-presidente o ministro da Agricultura, Pescas e Desenvolvimento Rural. Integram também esta plataforma intersectorial, queria eu dizer, os ministros da Economia, Educação, Saúde, Infraestruturas, Ambiente, entre outros. Nela tem assento a sociedade civil organizada, o sector privado, as academias e a associação do poder local. As decisões são tomadas por consenso, cabendo todavia, todavia ao governo a decisão final sobre as propostas discutidas. O Secretariado Técnico do Conselho funciona com base no Orçamento Geral do Estado e contribuições dos parceiros de desenvolvimento de Santo Tomé e Príncipe. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores excelências, cumpre-me esclarecer que o nosso Conselho Nacional está coerentemente interligado ao Conselho de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da CPLP e também do CSA. É uma instância de construção e coordenação de políticas e ações intersectoriais e inovadoras em matéria de transformação do sistema alimentar. Relembrar que na sua quinta reunião ordinária realizada no passado dia 8 de julho, o Conselho aprovou, só a título de exemplo, a montagem de uma estratégia nacional para que o nosso país seja 100% agroecológico. Este ambicioso programa a ser desenhado por um grupo de trabalho, dará continuidade e se articulará com outro processo já em curso no país, tendo em conta que somos o país africano com maior superfície de terra útil para a agricultura, cerca de 70% biológica e agroecológica. Para a materialização desse desiderato, contamos com o apoio do recém-criado Centro para a Promoção da Agricultura Familiar Sustentável da CPLP, implantado em Santo Tomé com o alto patrocínio da FAO. Através do programa Santo Tomé, e príncipe 100% bio, pretende-se não apenas produzir alimentos com maior qualidade, mas também criar condições para o fortalecimento dos produtores familiares, preservação dos recursos naturais e redução contínua da incidência de doenças derivadas da má nutrição. Portanto, com uma nota de otimismo pelo caminho já percorrido até aqui, no capítulo da segurança alimentar e nutricional, na certeza de que o muito do que nos falta percorrer e carreiras na ultrapassar, Santo Meio Príncipe contará sempre com todos os seus parceiros 
de desenvolvimento multilaterais, muitos presentes nesta plataforma de videoconferência, sem esquecer um grande leque de parceiros bilaterais, setor privado e sociedade civil. Muito obrigado pela atenção dispensada. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for your presentation about the experience of Santomi. And my apologies because apparently I got some problems with my microphone when I was introducing you. So now I will give the floor to uh, Mrs. Isabel Tuza, uh, who is the Vice President of uh, Montpellier Mediterranean Metropole, uh, in charge of uh, agroecology and uh, sustainable food systems. And she's also the mayor of a small town, uh, uh, which is uh, Murviel Les Montpellier. Please, Isabelle, you have the floor. Merci. Uh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Et uh, un grand merci donc pour uh, l'invitation. J'ai le plaisir de vous présenter uh, le, le témoignage d'un territoire, donc la métropole de Montpellier, qui est située dans le sud de la France. Alors, euh, c'est une intercommunalité, hein, ce qui est une originalité de, des lois de décentralisation en France, donc qui compte 31 communes, soit 500 000 habitants. Et ça représente la moitié de la population du département de l'Hérault. La France compte 90 départements. Et ce département est lui-même l'un des 13 départements de la région Occitanie. Euh, C'est un territoire très urbanisé, bien entendu, Montpellier est la septième ville de France, avec une forte spécialisation viticole, donc pas très tournée vers les productions alimentaires, et où on subit un très fort enfrichement des terrains euh, du fait de la pression urbaine, avec un tiers de la surface agricole utile enfrichée. C'est une intercommunalité, c'est-à-dire que depuis 45 ans, les 31 communes ont progressivement transféré toutes leurs compétences et les moyens afférents, financiers et humains, qu'il s'agisse d'eau potable, d'assainissement, de voirie, d'espace public, de sport, de, déco, de, de développement économique, etc., mais aussi, important, de planification urbaine. Alors, la métropole de Montpellier, depuis 2014, met en place une politique agroécologique et alimentaire. Donc, c'est une politique transversale qui concerne nombreuses de ces compétences dont je viens de parler, et c'est la première du genre en France pour une métropole. Et elle a été labellisée par le ministère de l'Agriculture français comme PAT, euh, Projet Alimentaire Territorial. Donc, bien évidemment, on en a beaucoup parlé jusqu'à présent, elle répond à de nombreux enjeux environnementaux, hein, ceux de la préservation de la biodiversité, de l'eau, des sols, euh, de limitation des émissions de gaz à effet de serre et de consommation d'énergie carbonée, mais elle répond aussi à, aux enjeux d'adaptation au changement climatique, aux enjeux économiques, sociaux, qui sont très forts dans notre métropole, et de santé, bien entendu. Cette politique agroécologique alimentaire est l'une un, des, des dix orientations du plan climat, plan climat, air, énergie, territoire, qui vise à atteindre les objectifs de la COP21 à l'horizon 2050. Euh, donc, on a, cette politique euh, est structurée en trois axes, avec trois grands objectifs structurants. Un premier grand objectif qui, est, qui concerne la production agricole nourricière et qu'on intitule « façonner un territoire nourricier » acclimater et préservant les ressources naturelles. Et là, euh, ce qui est important sur le, de, à voir, c'est que notre politique agroécologique et alimentaire est fortement structurante dans les documents de planification urbaine et de préservation des terrains en zone agricole et naturelle contre l'urbanisation. Et on a des objectifs opérationnels de mobilisation du foncier, qu'il soit public ou privé, pour installer des agriculteurs et des éleveurs et faire en sorte que cette agriculture familiale nourricière reconquiert le, le périurbain. À ce stade, on en est par exemple déjà à 500 hectares mobilisés, une vingtaine d'unités de production créées et environ 50 emplois créés. Et là, on travaille avec les communes, le, la région et l'État, dans, le, dans des cadres contractuels. Un autre axe de ce de cette premier grand objectif, un, un autre volet d'action, concerne la diffusion des pratiques agroécologiques. Et là, on a tous les leviers liés à la, à la protection de la ressource en eau et les financements de l'Agence de l'eau qui nous permettent de travailler avec des agriculteurs euh, sur des nouvelles pratiques. Et on a aussi un rôle euh, en tant que territoire d'animation, d'archipel de ce qu'on appelle des fermes ressources. Il y en a une douzaine qu'on mobilise avec leurs euh, atouts de plurifonctionnalité, je dirais, pour euh, diffuser, euh, former, sensibiliser tout type de public, y compris les professionnels, à la question agroécologique. 
Le deuxième axe structurant de notre politique agroécologique alimentaire, ben c'est la suite, c'est la structuration de l'approvisionnement, d'un approvisionnement durable et résilient vers la ville. Donc là, l'échelle d'action est beaucoup plus large que le territoire, c'est avec les intercommunalités voisines, le département et la région. Et qu'est-ce qu'on met en place, par exemple ben, On a des outils de communication comme des plateformes numériques collaboratives qui nous permettent de mettre en exergue tous les points de vente en circuit court pour justement faciliter cette relocalisation des filières. Donc, on a par exemple jusqu'à présent 480 points de vente en circuit court recensés et ça continue sur le territoire. En tant que euh, métropole, on a également une, une compétence au niveau logistique et on a un schéma euh, directeur ambitieux pour notre marché d'intérêt national. Et là, c'est tout le travail qu'on mène avec les grossistes, mais aussi les producteurs pour toujours plus de proximité, de bio euh, pour la ville. On mène en place et on anime des groupes de travail thématiques autour de cette question de l'approvisionnement avec tous les acteurs de la filière pour filière par filière pour euh, approvisionner la restauration scolaire. Euh, en France, euh, les communes euh, sont en charge de toute la restauration scolaire jusqu'au primaire et ça fait un, des gros volumes. Et donc, on joue un rôle structurant euh, par ce levier-là. Euh, voilà, et beaucoup d'autres actions dans le domaine de la structuration des filières. Et enfin, le troisième volet de notre euh, politique agroécologique alimentaire est plus social, je dirais, est lié aux enjeux de santé et vise à permettre à tous les habitants d'accéder à une alimentation saine et choisie on insiste là-dessus. En effet, c'est des enjeux forts et qui se sont accentués depuis l'année dernière avec la crise sanitaire. On a un taux de pauvreté important qui s'accroît sur la métropole, une précarité alimentaire aussi accrue et un recours à l'aide alimentaire, à la distribution alimentaire en forte augmentation. Et donc, ce qu'on souhaite, c'est travailler déjà à des états des lieux de la situation alimentaire et nutritionnelle sur notre territoire et faire également avec nos partenaires, associations caritatives de la distribution alimentaire, connaître leurs besoins, leurs demandes en termes de produits de proximité et faire tout un soutien aux initiatives, aux innovations associatives et citoyennes pour des dispositifs de solidarité qui soient, fassent plus la part à la dignité, au choix, à l'inclusion sociale. Alors, pour faire tout ça, quels sont les leviers que possède un territoire comme le nôtre et comment on travaille avec nos partenaires ben déjà, une collectivité déjà est maître d'ouvrage, est propriétaire de terrain. Et donc, on a euh, sur, euh, dans ce domaine-là des, des enjeux d'exemplarité et d'entraînement. Tout le travail qu'on fait avec l'installation d'agriculteurs, par exemple, sur les terrains euh, de la métropole et des, et des communes, ou ce qu'on fait au niveau de notre marché d'intérêt national. On a un rôle également en tant que collectivité territoriale de planification, donc de, des aménagements, de réglementation et de mise en place de nouveaux outils d'aménagement euh, opérationnel dans ces zones agricoles et naturelles, donc au titre de nos compétences hein, qui nous ont été euh, transférées par l'État. Par exemple, on travaille sur les associations foncières agricoles. Donc ça, c'est quand même un, un outil et des leviers, des leviers très importants. On a un autre rôle en tant que collectivité, c'est de structurer l'action des acteurs socio-économiques. Donc, on conventionne avec tous les organismes qui sont signataires, il y en a 40, de, et je dirais de tous horizons, de toutes cultures, hein, qui sont signataires d'une charte pour l'agroécologie, l'alimentation durable que nous avons établie et construite avec eux. On a un quatrième rôle, qui est celui de coordonner l'action des différents acteurs sur le territoire autour d'enjeux stratégiques pour nous tous. Exemple, l'action foncière, la maîtrise foncière. On anime des groupes de travail pour faire en sorte que tous les, les faiseurs, je dirais, les décideurs de la maîtrise et de l'acquisition foncière travaillent dans le même sens, avec les mêmes priorités. On a aussi en tant que territoire un rôle d'organisation de, de la mutualisation des compétences. On a une grande ville-centre comme la ville de Montpellier qui compte bientôt 300 000 habitants et puis des communes périurbaines de taille plus modeste, on organise la mutualisation des expertises pour que cela rejaillisse sur l'ensemble des communes. Par exemple, c'est dans le cadre de la, des marchés publics, de l'ingénierie technique, administrative, financière, pour tout ce qui est mise en œuvre de ces projets. On a encore un rôle qui est celui de mettre en valeur toutes les initiatives du tissu économique. J'en ai déjà parlé, par exemple, avec les plateformes numériques qu'on a, qu a mises en place, mais aussi de rendre visible et de soutenir les actions citoyennes pour l'agroécologie et l'alimentation durable. Par exemple, on organise des moments clés dans l'année qu'on appelle le mois de la transition agroécologique, où justement toutes ces initiatives sont mises, vraiment mises en avant. Enfin, ben, tout ça, ça se traduit aussi dans, au niveau de la gouvernance de cette P2A, politique agroécologique alimentaire. Il s'agit bien, j'insiste, il ne s'agit pas d'un projet, il s'agit vraiment d'une politique publique donc assumé par les élus, 
c'est-à-dire que nos ambitions et nos priorités sont portées par les élus, les conseillers du conseil métropolitain et les maires des 31 communes, mais toutes les stratégies et plans d'action sont co-construites avec nos partenaires dans le cadre de cette charte. C'est une gouvernance qu'on a construite progressivement. On a commencé, je dirais, par l'action, donc à l'échelle de chacun des trois axes dont je viens de parler. Et on est en ce moment en train de mettre en place, à la fin de l'année et début de l'année prochaine, ou début de l'année prochaine, un conseil alimentaire territorial qui va englober l'ensemble des facettes de la P2A, donc de la fourche à la fourchette, je dirais. Et ce conseil alimentaire, nous, nous ambitionnons de le construire sur la base de la construction d'une vision partagée avec un exercice de prospective à l'horizon 2050. Voilà, donc nous, on est, on est heureux de pouvoir partager cette expérience. On le fait, on est membre de, du pacte, on a signé le pacte de Milan, donc on, on est prêt, et ce que on, en tant que collectivité, ce dont on est euh, avide, ce sont des échanges d'expérience avec les autres territoires euh, sur les cinq continents pour continuer à innover. Et euh, voilà, j'en dirai pas plus, Bruno, merci à vous tous et je me tiens à votre disposition. Uh, merci beaucoup, Madame Touzard, uh, for this very uh, interesting presentation uh, illustrating all the experiences which are developed uh, in the metropole of Montpellier. Uh, so I will now give the floor to um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Emilia Sanz, uh, who is a Secretary General of uh, United Cities and Local Governments. Please, Mrs. Seitz, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, for this opportunity, excellencies, ambassadors, uh, honorary, uh, honorable uh, panelists, uh, distinguished guests. Please consider all protocol observed. For the sake of time, allow me just to uh, recall how much we appreciate the OECD invitation and and the efforts that the members of the Global Alliance for the Territorial Governance for Sustainable Food Systems is, is putting into this. And in particular, some of, of its members that are traditionally a very important partners of local and regional government, the constituency that I represent uh, here. Uh, today, um, UN Habitat, UNCDF, uh, GIZ, AFD. Um, for, for us, um, it is, of course, very, very important, and, and, and we are very happy to hear how much um, importance is being given to, uh, to the territorial approach. Um, all of the speakers that have spoken today are, are very convinced of how different the coordination and, and the co-governance work needs to be if we want to transform um, the food systems of the, of the future. And I think that is a very, um, a very good start. Um, that, that territorial knowledge of the urban era um, understanding uh, the urban era as a, as a system of cities where there is a symbiosis between the rural and the urban is extremely important. But I think there is a piece here that we might be missing in, in the equation and that we certainly miss um, in the ecosystem that talks about uh, food security in general. The mechanisms for follow-up of the UN Food System Summit, for instance, um, are mechanisms that are not integrating local and regional governments yet. And I think if we don't make sure that that sphere of government is involved also in the global dis discussion, and that visions like the one that has just been presented by, um, by Montpellier are included there, uh, we will be missing an important part of the transformation of the food system, but also the very critical link between uh, the, the food system discussion and the other global agendas that are very intertwined with the agenda that we are discussing today. For our constituency, and this is why United Cities and Local Governments is part of the ad hoc working group uh, uh, together with FAO, OECD, ICLE, and other organizations and, and UN Habitat, is because we think that local service provision and sustainable local service provision is very critical for, uh, for the food uh, production of the future because we will need to link mobility, water, sanitation, and health, but also housing and, and, and eco the ecological transformation. 
to the discussion on the food system. And like the Vice President of Montelier has been pointing out, there are very important roles that uh, local governments, any sphere of government need to play, also in changing the mentalities of the, of the citizens and changing the understanding of what the food um, system and food market needs to be. Um, we believe that cities and territories cannot be understood only as consumer of food, but rather as catalyst actors uh, for an inclusive new food governance. It, it should build on, on solidarity, but it should also put well-being and health at the center of the, of the food production. And there is here two aspects that we would like to highlight. The democratic, um, the democratic access to nutritious food is very critical for us. And this is something that is changing and is being triggered by, uh, by, uh, by cities right now, by the urban areas. But also um, the, uh, the, the need to make sure that uh, distribution is organized uh, differently and that proximity comes into play when we talk about food system. And it doesn't mean that we are only consuming what we produce locally. It, it does mean that there should be a new logic in, in, into this and much more awareness about what is a local uh, product and what is not, uh, how good the, the eating habits can be for you um, or not. Our renewed relationship with nature will be very critical for that ecological transformation that we all uh, are aware is, is, is needed. Food systems have a very big impact in, in carbon emissions and, and of course uh, also in, in the waste systems and waste production. And we think without the involvement of local and regional governments at the um, decision-making tables also, not only nationally, but also uh, internationally at regional and uh, global level, we will really uh, face great difficulties in the transformation of the, of the system. So uh, we really commend the efforts that are being made and that have been described here today, for instance, by, by Sound Tome. We very much agree with some of the perceptions that were presented by uh, the Argentinian uh, ambassador, but we are here to plea for a, a clearer seat at the global discussion for local and regional governments, uh, for the local and regional governments uh, constituency. We feel that the networks that are being created by, uh, by cities uh, can have a very important uh, trigger effect uh, in, in, in learning from each other. Peer learning will be extremely uh, critical. And it will be also very important to add aspects around um, people in the situation of vulnerability, uh, women, uh, but also uh, labor laws, and technology-based approaches. This is the kind of issues that we would like to bring to, um, to, the, to the food summit and that we are very pleased to, uh, to work around uh, with you all. Um, this plea to have local and regional governments at, at the discussion table uh, within the follow-up mechanism of the UN food system is one that I think is, is very timely and, and fits really well with the developments around the new common agenda that the UN Secretary General is, is pushing for. If we are already convinced that this territorial approach is one that we cannot avoid, then there needs to be a mechanism where these voices and visions are uh, looked at beyond case studies of what can work and uh, as a co-creation space for our constituency. I am convinced that, um, that there can be a turning point um, as we work towards this UN uh, food uh, system. I am very grateful for the, the visionary efforts that the Italian government is putting into the G20 discussions. And I fully agree with the assessment of ASISA that we are at the, at the very critical uh, uh, point to uh, change the way in which local governments are involved in these discussions. I would end by saying that um, our constituency is organized, is already doing many things, and it has the capacity to actually structure itself to be a good interlocutor for any mechanism that, um, that is put in place.
place. So I'm very grateful uh, to be given the opportunity to speak here before you today. And I look forward to seeing you also as uh, in, in the preparatory, uh, in the pre-meeting that will be taking place uh, next week. We also have a, a side event where I hope we can um, enhance our exchanges and, and uh, further debate um, these, these issues uh, with you. Thank you very much for taking local and regional governments into account. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Thais, for, for giving uh, the, the, the vision of, uh, of your organization, which is uh, very, uh, well, very helpful. Um, now, well, uh, as expected, and uh, I would say as usual, we are we are a little bit late with the, the schedule. So we will try to have a, a quick discussion based on the, the different presentations. And uh, uh, well, people didn't use so so much or at all the Q and A the Q and A uh, tool, but uh, well, there were many comments and uh, more comments than questions. But I. Uh, I, I know that there, are, there, there is a question from, uh, from Nipad, from uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kelilwe Roba Mualosi. Uh, so please uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Excellencies, all protocol observes. I'm coming from the African Union Development Agency. I would like to thank all the speakers for the excellent presentation made. But I would like to understand with what is discussed today and some of the, some of the good uh, practices shared today, will this move us to the next steps? Because I, in my own view, I think that also formulating a coalition that can really address this matter is also very uh, crucial. So I'd like to know if this can move this partnership forward. Uh, in Africa, for example, we do have what is called the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture the moment framework, which is called CADAP. It has been there for more than a, a, a decade and it involves all the governments uh, from the sub-national to national to regional governments. And it's also multi-level and multidisciplinary by nature. It calls all the governments to commit to 10% allocation of national budgets uh, to really improve the agriculture production and productivity. And our heads of state through the uh, Malabo Declaration in 2014, have committed to really account to the issues of food security and nutrition in Africa by 2025. And this involves all the governments that are, that are at national level and also at national level. So I'd like to know from you all that will this really help us to move forward. Over to you, speaker, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much for, for, your, for your question. So, well, we, we, we have a challenging uh, time constraints because I, I know that Massimo Torero uh, is also committed with another meeting and he's supposed to do the concluding remarks. So perhaps we'll have a, a, a quick uh, question which will be uh, uh, given by uh, Yves Zimmermann from the Metropole of Strasbourg and, and, and then we will, uh, we will move to the next step in the meeting. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, dear Excellency, for the, this presentation. It's, it was very interesting. I have to say, uh, as we began to work with the uh, food uh, system in Strasbourg, we uh, discovered that uh, uh, our uh, room uh, for action is quite reduced. We, if we want to develop a such sufficiency, we calculate that uh, we could only uh, feed 8% uh, of our uh, inhabitants because uh, uh, most of the of the territory is uh, uh, of the agricultural uh, territory is used for um, uh, feeding the animals. So uh, lastly, uh, the IDRI uh, French think tank released a, a report uh, promoting uh, agroecology and also based on the indicative decarbonization pathway for agriculture agricultural sector. Uh, led on by the French National Low Carbon Strategy. Thus, this is very, uh, a very interesting uh, way because a multifunctional uh, scenario was led uh, for agroecology, binding climate, biodiversity, health, and, and employment. Uh, this could gener general, 
generate uh, multiple benefits. But the economic uh, viability of such a scenario relies on uh, simultaneous uh, changes in supply, demand, and market organization. Even though this model fits to our political commitment, uh, we have to say that uh, uh, we need three uh, significant uh, policy changes. We need first a, a proactive uh, approach on national level demand. And I am sorry, but may I ask you to to to, to shorten a little bit because we we have also the yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, it, it will be uh, quite quite short. Um, our need is uh, is uh, to to um, uh, have a, a, an ambitious approach on international trade and promote and support the adoption adoption of uh, production standards. I, I have to say. Uh, we have to change paradigm. If we if we talk about a territorial approach, we need to work with territories, territories, and letting them having a word on decision. Uh, my question is: How can we reshape international multilateral, multilateralism in order to accelerate transformation uh, and better work with urban areas? Because as uh, Mrs. Uh, Tuza uh, demonstrated perfectly, uh, urban areas are the most reactive, agile, adaptable level of action. So thank you for uh, responding to my question. Okay, thank, thank you. So uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think we will be able to to engage uh, in a series of answers from the panelists. Uh, 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 so they, they, were, they were quite interesting question from, from the floor, particularly with regards of what can be the role of territorial governance initiatives with regard to environmental restoration or with regard to improved agricultural practices. But uh, as I said uh, in my introduction, all these inputs uh, are, are, are will be will be kept, and so uh, they will be reported uh, uh, in, uh, in the final document uh, with all the all the contributions which have been made. So uh, uh, we are we no need to to move to the final stage of our session, and uh, I will ask. Uh, uh, Mrs. Leanne Jackson from OECD, uh, she is head of the Agri-Food Trade and Market Division, to, to provide a quick uh, summary image messages which come out of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruno. I have the challenging, the challenging role of wrapping up in several minutes this very rich discussion. So first of all, thank you so much for including me. Um, and. Um, hello to everyone who's here on this call. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to wrap this up. I'll try to be very brief. I know we're on a time limit. Um, what we heard from the welcoming remarks was that this is a really important moment to think about how we can support the transformation of food systems. We have three really big events this year where food and agriculture need to play a role. We have the Food Systems Summit and we have the conferences of the parties for climate change and for biodiversity. And we know that agricultural and food systems need to contribute. So when I listened to all the comments that came in um, the, from the speakers and from the, the opening remarks, there were three themes that stood out to me. One was that there's no one size fits all. The second is we need to think about coherence, not just across disciplines and silos of governments, but also among different levels of governments. And the third is we need to pay attention to process. So just really quickly on the no one size fits all, we had some great examples from Sao Tome and Principe and also from Montpellier talking about the importance of really having a granular understanding of specifics at the local level of ecology and landscapes and water, but also of communities. So who are the communities that are um, engaging in food systems transformation? Who are the communities that maybe haven't had enough attention where we need to put more effort into including them into food systems in general and so that they can benefit from everything that food systems can provide. The second theme was coherence. 
So here, the work that my team has been doing also on food systems um, highlights that food systems are supposed to do three things. They're supposed to provide food, they're supposed to also ensure livelihoods across the whole value chain, and they're supposed to do it sustainably. And so what we see with the theme of coherence is that um, we need to think about how to address those three objectives simultaneously. And this requires thinking about breaking down silos within government, but it also clearly from the discussions we're hearing today on this territorial approach requires conversations to happen at the, at the local, um, the regional and the national level. So we had really great examples also from um, about the CFS and how they contribute to coordination from Ambassador Fernandez about the CPLP, also around coordination, the importance of having good architecture because the architecture matters in order to have trust. And we know that we need trust in order to have these effective dialogues across different levels of governments. And so finally, the third point is process really matters. Again, the work that we've been doing on food systems shows that um, if you're thinking about transforming food systems, you need to pay attention to differences in communities around the facts, around the interests, and around the values. And one of the really tricky things with food systems is that food is inherently a value proposition. So many actors within a food system are going to have different feelings about what food systems should provide. And in order to kind of overcome those stickiness, um, you need to make sure you have good processes, including these multi-stakeholder consultative processes. And here again, we had really nice examples from Montpellier and from Ambassador Fernandez, also um, from Sao Tome and Principe. And finally, I just wanted to um, give a little bit of a shout out um, for the remarks made by Ms. Saez from the UCLG um, about the fact that we really need these mechanisms in order to generate learning, because the only way we're really going to be able to overcome these things that get in the way of transformation is if communities have a process of dialogue and they can talk to each other. So I'll wrap up there because I can see Bruno needs to move on. <laughs> thank you very much for including me. Uh, thank you so much, Leanne, for these uh, key, key messages. So I hope that Massimo Torero, chief economist of uh, the FAO is still with us and can provide the concluding remarks. In the meanwhile, I may ask the speakers to try to provide answers to this couple of questions which have been raised in the chat. I, I know that some of them possibly started to do that, but please, Maximo, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And uh, apologies, I have to, to leave, but with this combination of virtual and physical meetings, it's impossible to, to have both at the same time. So thanks to all our colleagues of OECD uh, and FAO and our valuable partners who work hard to put this event together today. I would like to take a moment to thank the valuable insights of our speakers and discussions, as well as the rich lessons learned, providing that it is possible to build a multi-level governance architecture to promote sustainable food, uh, agri-food systems. Today and throughout the buildup of the United Food System Summit, the need for territorial governance solutions towards food system transformation is increasingly recognized as a necessary to achieve the global agendas, including the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. In light of this, FAO has decided since last year to move towards an integrated portfolio of investments and policy actions that carefully looks into economic, social and environmental sustainability. This is our hand in hand initiative uh, program, which work closely with national and local governments to promote inclusive, sustainable investments that integrate expertise of multiple sectors and the stakeholders going beyond agriculture to include social protection, health infrastructure and, and more. An effective governance with a strong institutional and financial support is key to understand the nature of challenges and identify solutions that are inclusive of all those whose lives and livelihoods are impacted by food and agricultural policy. This is the case of San Tomé Principe, one of the countries where hand in hand is being implemented. We need to ensure that governance frameworks are strengthened at local and national levels. And that's what we try to, to support through our hand in hand initiative, which is country led and country driven, using very detailed territorial approaches so that we can help in developing these areas which are rural very urban, and in some cases could be urban because of the continuum between rural and urban areas. And this requires appropriate, appropriate solutions uh, are identified to challenges faced by the most vulnerable, improving linkages between local 
rural and urban communities and other supranational decision making stakeholders. We need to take into consideration the lessons learned here today and join our efforts to build a multi level governance frameworks to promote territorial sustainable food systems. Thank you very much and, 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 and thank you for all, all the work being done. Thank you so much, uh, Maximo, for these concluding remarks. So I can just say that we are not so bad because we are only four minutes late uh, behind schedule. So we did quite well. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to have a, a more uh, intense uh, uh, discussion between uh, the, 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 the participants and the speakers. But as I said in my, in, in my introduction, so the, the, the chat, which has been very dense, uh, all, everything will be uh, reported uh, in the, the, the final uh, conclusion of the, of the event. And of course, it will be shared uh, among all the participants. So uh, I want to thank you again uh, in the name of uh, the, the organizers of the event for your participation, contribution and inputs. And uh, so let's uh, continue the progress toward, towards an improved territorial governance. Thank you and goodbye. Gracias.